Four years ago, uh, I gave this project the name of Doctors for Doctors. And for the last eight months, we've been really pushing it and expanding it into what it is now. Um, so it's my job to tell you guys a little bit about the history and how it all got started. Originally, um, I went on kind of a, like a tourism trip, basically, down to Nicaragua um, in, back in 2008. Uh, and it was there that I got to just meet and kind of hang out with a physiotherapist in Nicaragua. I was doing some really good work. This is her here, it's Maria. Um, and when I left from that, um, she had let me know that she's always wanted a TENS machine, but they just didn't have them for sale, like where she was in Nicaragua, and she didn't have access to one, but she was taught how to use it in school, and she's always wanted to be able to use one. Um, so I did like a little bit of fundraising when I got home, and I got her a TENS machine, I just shipped it over, and then I came down to just like see what uh, like see what she was doing, see how she was using the tens machine. Um, <clears throat> just talk to her and see how she practices a little bit as well, just because it was of interest to me as a chiropractor. Um, so I went down there um, and just got to really hang out, live with her family for a little bit, and I was here for a few weeks, <clears throat> uh, about three weeks, and her oldest daughter Helena was actually the one who kind of started the idea of what Doctors for Doctors was founded on, which was the idea of let's increase rural healthcare by sending really high potential students to medical school from those areas. So she was actually the original kind of person who sparked that idea because that was exactly what she wanted to do. So the idea kind of slapped me in the face. Um, <clears throat> after that, I uh, held a, a pretty large fundraising event at my school. Well, I would call it a, a large fundraising event, um, for sure, which is why I'm also not on ops. <laughs> which is why Mike does such a great job. Um, but I held a fundraising event at my school, and we fundraised around um, eight to $9,000, somewhere in there. And we did that just by all taking part in the Toronto Marathon and like pulling on our, on our contacts and networks um, for fundraising. <clears throat> So that was kind of the initial spark that got everything going. Um, now from that, we were able to sponsor our first medical student, um, Brian. Another like kind of smaller fundraising activity I did, just because it was, I would say, less organized, um, but probably more fun. Um, but I did a bike trip across Canada with a friend, and we were just promoting what we were doing while we were doing it, and we ended up fundraising thousand dollars from that which is like nothing for what it was but just something that was fun so from that money um, we sponsored Brian um, this is Brian here um, so we got put into contact with the foundation of Jean Brugger or Fundacion et Jean Brugger um, through a friend who was actually doing a master's in Nicaragua at the time and um, she had known, I think she was kind of working with the foundation in a different way through her research, but she had the idea to kind of link us together, um, which ended up just being fantastic. Uh, because with, with one of the, kind of one of the higher ups, like the administrators in FAJB, uh, we were able to design the program, kind of like the rules um, that we were gonna uh, find a student um, pay for their medical education and try to get them to go back to their rural community to give healthcare afterwards. So from that we sponsored Brian. Um, <clears throat> was like a very clear top choice out of about 20 really solid applicants and 12 interviews. Um, so we've been corresponding with Letter ever since then. And then um, just about six and a half months ago now, it was me, Mike, and Sarah went down. Um, just to, to meet Brian and see everything that we we're doing and kind of expand our programming on the ground and collect some, I guess, a lot of media as well just for the fundraising campaign that we wanted to do so we could really get this thing going. Um, it was awesome meeting Brian. It was actually fantastic. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that he and I are Facebook friends. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, as well, while we were down there, another student kind of fell into our lap that seemed perfect for our program. Um, her name's Kimberly. <clears throat> and, I mean, it always surprises me just like how many students there are that are in the same situation. Um, and so that's why, yeah, that's why I'm like, I'm excited to take this thing bigger and better and sponsor more people because there's just a lot of need. So that's kind of the history and Kimberly, uh, we basically just brought on, we just made the decision to sponsor her education after the successful fundraising campaign. So that was, that's really exciting. So she's our second student and she's also in medicine. About 10, ah, let's say a year, around a year ago, um, one of my professors at school who was the president of Global Peace Network, he was um, my physiology professor, his name's Brian Budgel. Um, he, he and I were just talking because I ended up TAing one of his classes, um, and we were talking about just the work that we had experienced in kind of the not-for-profit sector and how that was all going. Um, his charity is a very, I would say, unique charity in that it likes to kind of, I would almost say, foster other smaller organizations that want to become bigger. So their their official mandate and their official purpose as a charity, they do a lot of work out of Tanzania with street kids, but they also do work in healthcare centers. Um, and so they have a very, very wide mandate. Um, and with the name Global Peace Network, I mean, you could pretty much do anything. Uh, so, just in case for the Skype guys, I'm not sure how well you can read it, but to relieve poverty in developing nations by providing food, shelter, and medical treatment, and basic supplies to persons in need. To relieve poverty in developing nations by creating access to education um, and training so that the needs um, in the community can become self-sustaining and to develop and promote public health in developing nations. So we well fall within this category. I would argue that almost everything does, um, which is great because it allows, basically it allows us um, to do what we do in Nicaragua and allows them to do what they do in Tanzania. And as long as we're held um, very accountable for that and and basically, I'm held accountable officially as a board member of GPN. Um, then everything runs smoothly and it's fine. So as it stands now, um, GPN has its members. I'm going to do kind of a, a brief, like, quick overview of this. GPN has its members, its board of directors, and then its executive committee. Um, so I'm a member of GPN and a board of director, uh, like, on the board of directors of GPN. Um, and then the executive committee would be people that they contract out to build logos or do the website. This is like the structure of, of charity. Um, so the way we're kind of doing it, I would be the I would be on the board of directors of, uh, of GPN, and I'm the only member currently. Mike will most likely be elected soon, um, within the next like year for sure. Um, and then the executive committee would be kind of what I'm managing for Doctors for Doctors. Um, so the four main focus areas of, <laughs> of Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses is communications with Laura, research with Bo, operations with Mike, and programs with Sarah. And these are the different um, these are the different kind of main tasks that every uh, every focus area has under itself. So um, if you're a volunteer looking for a spot, these would be all of the different potential spots, and some of them are much higher priority than others right now, and that's going to be a lot of what the uh, the other directors speak to you about today. Some of, the, some of that isn't filled out, like yeah. programs and communications. Yeah, yeah. Sarah's a little sick, so it's not totally filled out. And, uh, but that's generally the, the structure that we're that we're going to be dealing with. Does anyone have any questions on that? Um. So hello. Uh, my name is Mike Carlson. I originally came onto the organization 
by meeting Andrew at UBC. Uh, we both went to uh, school at, in Vancouver. And then I did my undergrad in environmental science. I did a master's of teaching at U of T. Um, and then I worked in politics for a little bit and a couple of odd jobs. So, um, so my role here is basically for networking, fundraising, um, getting stuff done. Um, and so we have collectively called that operations. Um, so my official title with the organization is uh, Director of Operations. Um, so today uh, I basically want to talk about where operations has been, where it is now, where it's going, um, and then I'm going to give a, a brief financial picture of where the organization is at. So um, in terms of where operations is now is this. Um, so there are effectively, uh, and I just expanded one of those, uh, but there are effectively um, eight roles, I would say, uh, within operations. Um, four of them being, uh, I would say, the heavier ones, and then four of them being the lighter ones uh, that are more in the catch-all category. Where we came from was basically nothing. Um, it was very little infrastructure. It was um, Andrew. Um, Andrew pulled this together by himself for four years um, and brought it to a point where we had a student um, and we had a, a general mandate, but we had no fundraising infrastructure. We had very little brand. We had uh, very few tools to help the organization go forward. Um, in a, a period of about a year, of Andrew and I working together and putting post-its all over a wall um, and uh, bringing additional folks like the people in this room on board, we've now come to a place where the structure is is there. Uh, but literally six months ago, uh, it was not. Um, so we have come a really far away um, in six months. So this is essentially what we've got. So I, I want to go into each category here of what we're doing. Um, so the smaller parts uh, that were at the bottom, um, ops is a catch-all role um, in terms of what we do. Uh, anything that is um, not covered by anyone else um, is covered by operations. Um, the two things that I know that we're going to be doing uh, in the next three years um, and possibly sooner, USA expansion, um, that is one of my goals long term, as well as uh, we take risk analysis. These are just two examples of, of things that we would do at ops. Um, creative, um, there are a lot of degrees of freedom, of ways to move in what we're doing as an organization, and we must be creative. And I believe that a lot of that creativity must come from ops, um, that we must have the ability to um, turn on a dime to uh, take information in, synthesize it, and um, use our youth and inexperience actually as a, a benefit. That we don't have set priorities and policies um, often, and we need to build them. And we have a heck of a lot of smart people around. And we have well-networked people who know everybody. So that creative piece, I would argue, is essential in operations. Um, and should take up a good amount of time. Uh, coordination of resources, um, ops is the place that uh, just makes sure the money and the resources and the people are flowing through the organization appropriately. Um, and that coordination can take a lot of time. And then events such as the retreat um, that we're on now, such as um, any sort of fundraising events, um, networking events, those sorts of things. These are the smaller parts of, of what ops is now. Um, so onto the four larger pieces, started, starting with the smallest uh, and ending with the biggest, and what I think is the most important. Um, the human resources piece. Um, we are an organization. We need to operate like a business. Um, I am the one who always talks about money, and I'm always the one who talks about structure in terms of, it doesn't sound like it a lot of the times, because maybe we lack it a lot of the time. Um, but we need an employment strategy. Um, right now, we have a few contract employees that have done some work for us for individual 
stuff such as our website. Um, that's something that we needed to pay. We need an employment strategy moving forward, especially if we're going to be anything legitimate. Um, that uh, we need a volunteer strategy and policy um, that includes recruitment, retention, um, how they fit in, the workflow. Um, this is all something that needs to be done structurally. Um, and then in terms of professional development, uh, if we are going to be a real organization, we must, for everyone who is involved, have um, professional de development or how we are going to move forward and get better as individuals. Um, and I will fight tooth and nail to make sure that everyone in this organization, including all the volunteers, actually does have a PD plan moving forward. Um, my arguably favorite thing um, is networking. Um, I love it. I love people. That's why I'm in this role. Um, there are four main communities that we need to network into. Whenever anyone says anything to me that resonates in any one of these four things, my brain instantly goes there. Even if it's my aunt talking or whatever, um, this is how I'm constantly thinking, and this is how I'm going to push others in the organization to think as well. Um, first is obviously medical. Um, we need um, doctors and nurses um, to get on board, and the medical community in general. Um, if you know people, um, if I ever meet anyone, I'm talking to them, I'm giving my business card, I am trying to get in front of people as much as possible. Same thing with nonprofits. Um, we can't go it alone, especially in Nicaragua. Same thing with corporate. Um, our big donations and big support in terms of the accountants that can help us, the specialized skills, that's going to be um, corporate. And then finally, the Nicaraguan Latino community. Um, this, to me, is obviously something that I cannot do. Um, so we are trying to find uh, Spanish speakers and Latinos um, to come on board in a really big way to make sure that we can fill this void, which I clearly cannot. Uh, probably the most legally binding piece of what I do and uh, the riskiest uh, for me if I mess up is the accounting and financial piece. Um, we need to look at payroll, uh, we need to look at accounting, um, we need to start generating an annual report. I think it's a bit premature, um, but by, certainly by the end of 2015, we will be producing an annual report that will say exactly what we have done as a special project um, and who is on board and everything that's been done to date. Um, and then again, people get nervous when you talk about creative accounting. Um, it's a bad rap. Um, we solve problems and we have more financial problems than anything else. And we need to tackle them in a creative way. Um, um, so, uh, where we're at financially, Andrew went down to Nicaragua in 2008. Uh, the fundraising sort of started, the idea sort of started. Over three years, Andrew came together and actually pulled off the fundraising plan. So in 2011, uh, he raised $9,000 off the event and other miscellaneous fundraisers. Um, that money was spent uh, mostly on Brian's tuition in 2012. Uh, Brian's tuition is about $4,000, uh, as well as uh, a good chunk of that rolled forward um, into the following year. Um, so then in 2013, um, Andrew got an additional um, $4,000 um, from his fundraising, um, and that was through uh, your bike ride across Canada, uh, through a couple other. Um, so in uh, May of this last year, after about four months, four to six months of intensive planning, um, Andrew and I um, raised 4000 each. Um, I got private donors. Um, Andrew, again, did tutoring and a couple random bits and pieces. Um, and that was then uh, partially spent on Brian's tuition, uh, our Nicaragua trip in July, and then also comms tools, uh, so such as the website and our graphics package, 
um, which we had argued people down to like bare bones, like $100 here or there. Um, so we've had a lot of volunteer support to keep costs low. And then obviously, um, if you haven't heard, then that's terrifying. Um, but uh, we had a crowdfunding campaign um, that raised over $20,000, uh, which is uh, incredible uh, and super successful. Woohoo! Woohoo! Woo and fun. And fun. Yeah. Uh, I, I would challenge that statement. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, it was fun. There's fun time. It was There's fun time. so much fun that everyone should give us more money. So does the organization now sort of just have about the crowdfunding campaign money? Or is about. there still like transfers from? Uh, it's, it is uh, tricky because we have money trickling in after the crowdfunding campaign, so I can't give an exact figure. It is around the ballpark of $20,000, um, of which uh, about, in terms of raw expenses from the crowdfunding campaign itself um, and other expenses from a couple other people that we owe from the comms tools, um, that it's about 15000 total after all expenses is how much money we have. Yeah, our financial commitments uh, moving forward. This is the part that I find super motivating um, as ops, uh, but we have, made, we have made these calls. Um, that currently with about 15K in the bank, uh, we have three more years of Brian's tuition of $4,000 each, uh, each year. We have committed to Kimberly. Um, she will be around 3500 She's cheaper than Brian. Um, and she will be five more years. So ballpark, um, we can cover Kimberly. Um, we are about ten to $15,000 short um, given a five-year timeline uh, on where we're at. So we need to fundraise. Um, part of this is a calculated understanding on our part of what we have. Um, and then, yeah, there's also the, the fees for um, contracts and uh, materials and the crowdfunding campaign itself. Um, so we, yeah, we are sitting at around um, $15,000 over committed. And we are very confident. I am very confident in our fundraising capabilities. Um, fundraising is the biggest piece, arguably, of what I do um, and what we do in ops. If anyone comes to this organization, I will ask them if they can fundraise and make money. Um, it is my job to pester everyone until they hate me um, in the organization and asking you for money. Uh, because no one else is doing it and because the organization doesn't exist without money. Uh, there are three main streams of uh, what we do in terms of fundraising. Grants, private donations, and universities. Uh, because these are so large, we haven't had the ability to pursue grants or universities yet. We are slowly breaking into universities, um, and that's through setting up partnerships with student unions. That's with uh, getting in student, student associations and clubs. Um, that is with the medical students themselves or the nursing students themselves. Um, this is a huge stream of revenue for everything from possible programs that we run out of Nicaragua to uh, fundraising events in Canada. Um, the list goes on and on. I do also want to do a shout out to Creative again, uh, because I don't think people give this enough credit, um, that we must always be looking for better ways to do things and ways to think outside the box. Um, within the stream of private donations, uh, just to break that, that down further, um, there are corporate donations, there are individuals, and there are campaigns. Uh, we just led a campaign because we knew that uh, calculation-wise, we had the best chance of getting crowdfunding startup capital, and it worked, so we're moving forward. We now need to, that is not sustainable, so we need to launch other campaigns um, other than crowdfunding. Uh, we also do have events, but again, that's a tricky beast uh, because the returns on events have to be very well calculated and oiled out. Um, corporate donations and individuals are arguably, in my perspective, the way that we are moving forward financially over the next three years. We will get corporate donors to sponsor students themselves, and we will um, have individuals, hopefully wealthy individuals, backing our organization as we continue to do more good work. 
Um, that's what uh, the current picture in Ops is uh, for anybody here, anybody on Skype, or anybody watching um, this video at some point. Um, we need Ops and we need fundraisers. Everyone says it. But I think very few organizations can deliver um, the autonomy and the responsibility and the support around um, learning and growing with our organization. Um, and that's really my hope is to foster an ops team that can fundraise over $100,000 next year. Um, and I know that I personally can fundraise $100,000 next year. And for every additional person, that's just going to grow in likelihood and uh, but next year. And next year. Yeah. This, the, By the end of the, the year. coming year of 2015, for sure. It is the current year. The <laughs> year that we are in and looking forward into. Um, in terms of the future, we will hit 100K um, in 2015. Um, and I have no idea after that what will happen. Um, but that will be, I would argue, 60% corporate. About 30% private individuals um, slash corporate, um, and then about 10% events. This is what I'm expecting. So. Sorry, do you mean 100,000 more than the? the this year, movie? from this point on, we will raise an additional 100,000 um, dollars. So I just want to lay out like who our audiences are, what the communications channels that we use are, and like what strategies we need to. Uh, figure out a plan for or set goals for um, right away so that all the other tasks, which are fairly straightforward, um, can be dealt with in, a, in an efficient way, I guess, so that we know exactly what, ha like how we want to communicate, how we want to make ourselves look, essentially, to the public. So I'm just going to tell you who our audiences are, what the communication channels are, and what the strategies are that we need to do a little bit of work on um, right away. So our audiences are kind of, there's like two different areas. So there's like the general public, volunteers, potential donors, current donors, and the poor. This is like um, a wider scope. And then with more focus, we have to think about how we want to manage uh, communications in our relationships with doctors, nurses, and specific communities. Um, so I feel like we are, like communications is really just complementary in a lot of ways to, to most areas. There's some really independent stuff that, that I'm going to be doing, like the social media um, component. And then there's a lot of just like each area needs help from communications um, for certain projects. So, and I'll kind of touch on those. Um, so our channels are the newsletter, which will begin this year, which is a new thing. Um, so this is part of my plan, so that um, each department will, I'm hoping, if you're all okay with it, um, send me regular updates about what you're doing and what you're working on. So And in a way that, I mean, I'll edit it and make it pretty for the newsletter, but essentially that's pretty just grab and go, um, so I can just parachute it into the newsletter and not have to do a crazy amount of work on that. Um, so, and then other things that it might include are staff changes or new volunteers or announcements about new students, upcoming events and campaigns, or if we have like blank spots, um, obviously stories are nice to have. So stories about our students, stories about success, successful things that have happened in programs or research or whatever. So in general, I'm just going to repeat this indefinitely, probably forever, every time we all meet. Um, whenever you are doing anything in your work that makes you think, oh, maybe we should tell the public about that. Or like, oh, nurses would love to hear that story. Or whatever, um, that you think is just like worth sharing then let me know. And because I really think that, especially after yesterday, we want to have a general attitude of transparency um, and like letting people know what's going on. Because, because I think it's really enticing for people to, to become involved in the culture of, a, of an organization. Like, it's really clear from we were, we were admiring the Charity Water website just now, but also last night. And 
it's really clear that what's working for them, what we all like about them, is that you can see exactly what they do um, right away on their website, and it's like their culture is really enticing. So they have like really fun pictures of themselves, like in their like uh, individual profiles on the website, like holding water water jugs in their hand, and it just looks like it's a fun place to work. I was immediately like, I want to work there. But it's not just that, because as soon as you see like that it's a cool place to work, you automatically think like it's a cool uh, concept. They're probably really smart. They know what they're doing. They're intelligent. They're successful. It just creates this positive picture overall of what the company is or what the organization is. So I think one way for us to do that is to be really open about everything that we do and what we're working on. And maybe not down to the nitty gritty details, but like, you know, it's Andrew's just sitting there like, I don't know what you, what, whatever project you're working on and you're like, oh, I'm working on this really great project today. Uh, maybe I should like, I don't know, update Facebook and be like, oh, I'm so excited about working. I would love it actually if everybody actively updated Facebook. Um, at first we talked about just having a really clear voice and I actually am realizing that because on Facebook it tells you exactly who's posting, that's not 100% necessary. Obviously we need a lesson in like what's appropriate to post and what's not, but like directors could actually post on Facebook independently of me and be like, here's what I'm up to today, it's really great, Doctors for Doctors is so much fun to work for, blah blah blah, whatever. Um, I think that I think that that would be a benefit to us because people just want to know what we're doing. It's interesting. I think. I mean, if you disagree. Um, so yeah, so that's what the newsletter will be like. Um, went on a bit of a tan tangent there. The website needs pretty much an overhaul. I think again, like the branding and the graphics that it, like the basic structure is is pretty great. Um, but I think we would all agree that like we really need to uh, be more clear about what we do talk about certain things in more detail, uh, probably get more videos, better gra better pictures, like not just uh, graphics, but photos of people. And I think that is something we have to make a pretty big priority for communications because, and so especially with those girls going down in February, I really hope that like, if nothing else, they can bring back a bajillion pictures yeah. of, of at least one of the students, if not both, hopefully just a million pictures of Kimberly. But anyway, it just, I think, just people doing stuff. I just want there to be a photographer with anybody who ever goes down um, because I think it makes us look good. And looking good is how we, sadly, how we make money. Um, so yeah, so I have this internal conflict about communications where I think it's really sad that in order to make money we have to look really good. Like, but yes, what I do. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> so for the blog, I think that um, it would be great, once again, to have regular input from every department. So I, my vision was like each person, like each director would write one or two blogs a year, and then we would have like supplemental blogs from whoever is interested in writing blogs, so definitely volunteers, as much as volunteers are interested. And like when you're working on a project, like here's what I've been doing, it's really great, I like from directors for directors because of this. Um, and what I want to do, fairly soon in the next month or two is, is just be, come up with like a blog template so that when people sit down to write a blog it's not like I don't know where to start here. Um, it's just like who, what, when, or why. Just say what you're doing and why it's interesting and, and it's pretty simple to write a blog. Um, so yeah, so that's the website and the blog is actually called updates on the website. I, I, I don't know if we want to change that. I would like to, with whoever becomes the communications team going forward, sit down and like go over every single section of the website and like talk about how it could be improved or if it's good the way it is. Um, <coughs> long term for the website, sorry, I just to go back and write this down. But I really, I really think, um, I really think that sooner or later uh, we will need to like. I think I really like the branding. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that it's the branding's really nice. Um, but I think we need it to be. It's definitely a good like starting point. It, it is very it's professional, but I think long term we want it to be even more dynamic and even more. Um, uh, more I think like what, again, what charity called? water. Yeah, what charity water does is really great because. Uh, 
they they're just unique. Actually, I think I think I want to be more unique, um, and I think I want it to just be more like a little bit more modern and a little bit more um, clear what our I, th I want it to like mirror once we have a really clear structure internally organizationally I want the website to mirror that so it's just really obvious what we do um, so that's <coughs> so social media so far I don't know why that's bolded it's not more important um, social media so far is really so just to be clear, a lot of this is like my plan, and it's not so much really so far. You probably already all know what we what communications has consisted of. Um, the only thing that's not public that we've worked on is to start the foundations of a corporate um, responsibility sales. Uh, what, I don't know what you want to call that sales booklet or whatever. So um, outside of that, social media website is is what communications has been. And I've really been only working at it for two months. So uh, this is moving forward. I meant to say that at the beginning and I forgot. So yeah, so social media so far and in the future is just consists of regular updates on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we also do have like a LinkedIn page. And there's something else, but it doesn't matter. Um, and, and I just personally, but please correct me if you think I'm wrong, find that LinkedIn is fairly minimally uh, useful. I don't think people like check their LinkedIn regularly. I think it would be good for maybe recruitment if we had someone doing HR at some point. Um, but outside of that, I'm not sure we need to be updating it really regularly. So um, for Facebook, regular, informative, interesting updates that are strategic based on whatever we're working on at the time or whatever we need to publicize at the time. Um, you know, balance with like with updates about research and probably often the stuff that we post in the newsletter is going to be on Facebook and Twitter repeatedly uh, because repetition is key in, in social media and in advertising. People aren't going to see it the first time so it's okay to post things twice. Um, so yeah, so regular social media, or regular Facebook updates and um, an ongoing effort to just build a Twitter audience. It just takes a long time to build an audience on Twitter and like Following influential people helps. Being, yeah, for sure. Um, and just getting people to tag when they come to events or if they're with us. Um, and then all of their followers will want to follow. Right, well. right. And okay. we've started to do that a little bit, um, but I will be brutally honest that Twitter is not my passion. <laughs> so I like do as much as I can, and like once in a while I'll go on a little like binge of like, I'm just gonna follow all these really awesome people, or like I'll try really hard to mention people for a while, um, but then I'll just like take a break from it because I think it takes a lot of work and a, it's a it's a tough slog for a long time until you have, until you have a really good Twitter following and are really effective. But I think you have to be really engaged. So um, going forward, Twitter is actually one area where I would love to have someone be in charge of that. But um, we we have to have a this is part of the strategy going forward. We have to have a uh, clear voice across all, especially all web communication. Um, and yeah, so other terms, other kinds of content are just stuff from other areas, basically. Um, so, so I'm hoping that like if we're all sharing our, our regular updates about what we're doing um, in writing, then I can just take blurbs from what you guys are doing and share it on stuff. And I think. Probably, uh, it, we'll have to work a little bit more closely with research for for regular content. So, I'm, like, I'm hoping that people who are doing research, when they find an article that's like interesting and probably accessible in a in a readability sense for the public, um, that we can just like send links my way all the time. Okay, cool. Uh, you can leave um, the video that's one thing that we just kind of have to come to like turn into a rhythm internally. It's, it's just. It's not gonna come naturally, and I'll probably just try to send regular updates. Be like, guys, got anything for me? <laughs> like, send me content. Um, just because the the biggest issue that I'm finding, like my challenge, is that I don't sit down and like do research on my own. Or like, I definitely have like um, regular news updates that I get by email and stuff for content. 
um, or for information about Nicaragua, and I have um, like Google alerts for certain things, and I'm a member of a bunch of newsletters. Um, there's a minimal amount of English news and information that comes out about stuff that's going on in Nicaragua. Um, so part of it is actually that, that we just need more uh, Spanish speakers and, and readers who are like finding content that can be translated or just linked to in, linked to in Spanish. Um, that's actually something I didn't write down here, but Spanish communication assistance is, is needed. Because <laughs> um, obviously there's a whole audience there that we're not reaching. Sorry, did Sophia or translate everything? No. Okay. Um, so these are other streams of communications that are we either do in some capacity now but could do better, like video production, uh, or that we don't really do or use uh, effectively but might want to consider. So yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that because that's, again, something that we don't need to discuss here. Uh, in great detail. Um, I do want to mention that like word of mouth was kind of part of what I was touching on earlier when I was advocating for everybody to care about fundraising um, because I think that that is how, I think that that's the most, that people trust each, their friends and family um, to tell them about like cool projects or cool ideas or whatever, fundraising efforts, um, more than they trust any of the other methods of communication. So like word of mouth marketing is, in my opinion, one of the best ways to get people's attention. And to that end, I think we could really benefit from doing things and taking on projects that are going to get people talking about what we do. So like we talked about yesterday, the uh, like being really blunt and open, having videos where people are just like, here's what we do. It's not perfect, but we're doing our best. Um, or, yeah, we even joked around at the beginning of the crowdfunding campaign about, because one of the uh, best ways to get word of mouth is to elicit strong emotions in people. So, like, uh, getting people to laugh or cry or get angry in some cases, not that we really want that one, or um, to just like feel really strong empathy. Um, those are the best ways to get things to go viral on the internet. So those are the communications channels, and then this is things we need to think about in terms of strategy. Um, there's This is just the first five things I thought of. Um, so this is a long, long list, and I've already mentioned some of the things throughout this conversation so far. Um, and I think that there will just have to be ongoing strategy meetings or brainstorming sessions um, to deal with some of them. And I think also probably a lot of it is just going to be organic. We're just going to realize that like the best way to go about communicating on certain topics is this, based on the reactions we get from people. Um, <coughs> but that said, once again, I am not constantly reading every bit of research or that comes out about stuff that's going on in Nicaragua in terms of like health and stuff. Um, so if there are topics that are coming up, like new issues um, that people become aware of, then it's probably a really good idea just to make sure that I'm aware um, so that we can make sure that we're on top of that stuff. So in terms of volunteer requirements, these are areas where I think communications could use help. Um, yeah, there's just like areas of knowledge or expertise or, or even just interest. Um, so this would ideally help volunteers to gain, uh, to like, for lack of a better word, to do some professional development. So it's like, you might know a little bit about one of these things, but want to get better at it so that that can be something that you can offer um, to future jobs. Alright, so I am both oh, good. No, and I am director of research, so I'm going to go over today a little bit of the context of sort of what research we'll be doing. If you're involved in research, what are some of the activities that you can expect? Uh, I'm going to talk about what are sort of the deliverables that we want to have coming out of research uh, in the next little while. So specifically, what kind of projects we'd be working on. Um, and then I also want to get into the research approach. So how we as an organization are treating research, what sort of our context is in terms of how we consider 
research, what we consider to be good research, um, and yeah, we'll talk about a little bit about methods uh, and partnerships and sort of how those will play into what kind of research we'll be doing. Um, so to start off, I just to give like a bit of a context on Nicaragua and uh, its health indicators. This is like not up for like its research like data or anything or to say like this is the way um, we're going to operate. It's more to show that, to just change your ideas of sort of what being a research department is within the context of Doctors for Doctors and changing your ideas of health and how we're going to treat that. Um, so this is taken from the Social Progress Index um, and there's Nicaragua on top, Canada on the bottom. Um, and you're given a score out of 100, um, so you can see sort of how Canada ranks up against Nicaragua. And there's it's, the social progress index is broken down into three categories. So basic human needs, foundations of well-being, and opportunity. And this sort of can start to give us an idea of some of the areas that we can start to break into. So luckily with like Nicaragua, you can look and see that their thing, like nutrition and basic medical care are generally doing pretty good. Um, all things considered, like 84 is a pretty good score considering like, um, yeah, just in general in the world. So um, if we look like more at something like personal rights, uh, we can see that like, we're really not doing so well in Nicaragua with that. And that's something <coughs> that personal rights do influence people's health and that then shows us like that could be a vector and a way of us tackling some of the health issues within Nicaragua is actually going through personal rights. So beyond sort of just reporting direct medical data on people, what a lot of the research is going to be doing is checking in to see like how does opportunity and personal rights interface with people's health and how can we as an organization tackle something like personal rights that's more of a social issue and tie that into a health context and make that a health issue um, and seeing what do what does the lack of personal rights do in terms of people's um, health outcomes. Um, so yeah, <coughs> uh, moving, this is more of the information on Nicaragua going down again. Um, and the one I really want to bring up is access to advanced ed education. Um, so Nicaragua is doing really poorly here, um, which I think is kind of cool for us in the like, sponsorship program and that we are creating more access to advanced education. Um, and we're not doing that in a way that is just like pushing people into school Regardless, like we've talked about nurses for nurses and how you know that's probably not the approach that we want to take for nurses is getting them into school because there is a lot of nurses it's easier to access but for doctors we can see that that's a limiting factor and you know that's something that we can look at um, I mean again this is very very general and like it's not something that's being heavily researched by me at all but it's just a way of looking at the country and seeing sort of areas that we might be able to access. Um, you'll see the red and blue circles beside things. The blue circles indicate that based on GDP for similar country, countries with similar GDP, they're doing better, relatively better. Um, it's not to say that they're doing really good, it's just that they're doing better than other people sort of within the same economic range. <coughs> So, for example, satisfied demand for contraception, um, they're doing relatively good compared to other countries at that financial level. Um, I know if Sarah was here, she would take issue with like the idea that they're doing good in that sense, or like there's a lot of these, and I don't want you to think like that the blue circle means they're doing good, it's just they're doing better than other people at the same financial level, um, which Nicaragua was quite impoverished, so. Um, you know, that's the kind of class of country that we're looking at. Um, and then we can also see where they're doing worse. So, 
for example, rural versus urban access to improved water. It, they're doing quite poor in that regard. So uh, relative to other countries around them uh, that have similar GDP, that's like an area that we could work on. Uh, making sure that people have access to clean water. Um, it's a sustainable source of water. And where we're really seeing that is going to be in rural areas. So moving forward, that could be an area that we'd be getting into. And again, it's not a direct health issue of this person has this communicable disease and we want to work on it, but it's an infrastructure issue. And we're tying that back into our overall mission of health and improving access to like a healthy living environment and access to healthcare. Um, and again, just to sort of compare with Canada, um, here's our data. Um, so we're doing quite a bit better on a lot of these things. That's where we're, just in terms of comparison, you can sort of see there are some, uh, yeah, there's differences. There's a lot of areas that we can also go to uh, that are similar. For example, rural versus urban access to improve water sources. So what we do in, there will be similar challenges as well, given like rural access to water in Canada can, sustainable and clean sources of water can also be an issue here, as it can be in Nicaragua. And the research that we're going to do is going to lend itself heavily, whichever country we're doing the research from. And we're going to try and borrow from other countries, similar countries, because there's not a lot of research on things specifically in Nicaragua. Um, so we'll try and make generalizations if we can't get direct details, and then try and, as a way of identifying what problem areas we might be able to get into. Um, yeah, so just keep in mind that research is not sort of stuck to just doing strict health issues, but goes beyond that into social issues and um, how we're going to be tackling how we integrate infrastructure issues and other uh, areas that have those tie into health and our overall mission. So generally in terms of activities, um, I've broken it down to global and local. Um, global is where we're going to be do focusing most of our research in the next while. And that's people here in Toronto, people in Vancouver, people like all of our volunteers um, sort of collaborating online to do these things. And the vast majority of what we'll be doing is finding, reading, and summarizing academic articles, as well as great literature. So uh, this is like Spanish websites, newspapers, anything that has that sort of local information that's not going to make its way up to academic articles, but still has really valuable information for us and gives us a better sense of what's going on, what are areas that we might want to start running research projects in to identify needs and other programs we can start running. Um, we're going to do a lot of report writing, so we want to be really clear and transparent with how we're doing research, letting people know the approaches that we're taking to research, what we're finding, and showing them that we do have that evidence base for running our programs. And we're not doing programs because we think that like, it's just something that we personally think we'd like to do or that it necessarily is like a good thing for public relations, but that we do have an evidence reason for being in that area and that we can present that. So if anyone ever asks, well, why did you choose that city or why did you choose that student or why did you choose this area, we can demonstrate that we've got a method to doing that and we've researched that. Um, and yeah, the other idea from a global um, standpoint, we want to start identifying new programs we might be able to run. Um, investigating things, so like helping Sarah out with something like the mobile health clinic, um, identifying what resources we need, what areas we can tackle, what are the health issues beforehand, so we can start mapping that out and say, well, you've got this truck now, where are you going to go? And rather than just go to like communities that we've sort of heard of on the ground, we also want to like map it out on a country level to see, like, well, actually, we have no projects running in the north, and we know that there's a ton of health issues we could tackle in the, the north. That would be an area that we want to like start looking towards planning then. Um, and another big thing is finding partners that we can work with. So wherever we're going, identifying partners, identifying their strengths, identifying whatever biases they may have so that we know, you know 
we're not going to send in like some machismo engineering group that might be really good at like building whatever it is they build, but like are not going to listen to like the women's collective that we're working with and we're trying to serve. Yeah. So that's a big part of the research is figuring out not just like what partners can do, but also where they're best used and where they have limitations so that we can manage those relationships. Um, it's I really want to work on having things as local as possible and using local people whenever we can, but we do have to manage those relationships. And that's a big part of our role outside of the country is to identify where people are going to fit best and what their strengths are. Um, so we're still using local people, but just managing that situation a little bit better. Um, eventually, we're also going to want to start moving into more local-based research um, programs. So this is largely going to involve Andrew um, going down to Nicaragua, doing research in Nicaragua. Um, and it's going to be original research. So uh, in the next while, we're going to identify gaps in the literature, gaps that like we need to fill for programs, for uh, our operations and everything moving forward. As we identify these gaps, we're going to start building up research projects for um, Andrew or whoever else might be going down um, so that they have very solid research projects that we can say, this is what's going to be most helpful for us and if you can identify these things, because um, we can't get that information anywhere else. And that's really going to help us build up our local programs in a really informed way. Um, we're also going to start to do monitoring and evaluation on the programs that we're running and to make sure that everything's running smoothly. Um, everything's like we're getting feedback on how to improve things. Data collection so we can present our numbers. So if we have a mobile health clinic out there, we can start getting health data for areas that are underserved that aren't being researched and we can sort of show there's these health issues in this area of the country or there are these social problems, these are the things that we want to start looking at. Um, and by publishing that data, we can also get other people involved, um, people who have other expertise and letting them know that you know, we're not going in and holding our data necessarily to ourselves to just have it be projects we want to work on. I think it's good to have that data. This is a conversation we can all have, but I think having open data and letting people see uh, to a certain extent what's going on, what are the problems, allows other groups opportunity to partner up with us and search us out and see that they have relevant skills to fit with our need. Um, and yeah, again, being local, you're going to get more information just from being able to talk to people, talking about what resources they have, so we'll identify new programs potential new programs that we can come up with, uh, new partners that we can work with. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, in the, May, like in the next while, it's really going to be a lot of the stuff that's in the global section um, and like the local stuff. Uh, things like monitoring and evaluation, data collection stuff, it's stuff we can do with our partners who are in Nicaragua already. Um, and it's about designing that and collaborating with them to be able to figure out what information we need from them, what they're comfortable collecting data on, and what they're comfortable sharing with us. Um, and then eventually having some sort of a research presence. Um, and from talking with Andrew um, yesterday, it's not that we're shipping Andrew down there and he's going to just live there permanently and like do research there all the time. Although that would be sweet. <laughs> for us, maybe not for Andrew. Um, just locking him into Nicaragua forever. Um, yeah, but it would be, so probably sending people down on research trips, but again, because we're building up that local presence in terms of local partnerships um, and local connections, we're, even though we don't necessarily physically have someone from Canada down in Nicaragua, it doesn't mean that we've left the country or that we're not having ongoing relationships and conversations with partners in Nicaragua. So we should, like, in between research projects, we're going to be talking to people, getting the groundwork laid out, and then after them, we'll be doing like a debrief with them, figuring out what worked, what didn't work, ongoing monitoring, um, so we know exactly what's going on, how to move forward. Um, in 
terms of deliverables, these are some of the ideas that have come up in the last little while um, on things that we can start working on within research to be able to, uh, just as terms of projects we can work on. So eventually I'd like to start doing, uh, getting some academic articles published um, with our data. This is going to be really key. Um, we're going to start doing blog posts um, in conjunction with communications, figuring out um, some topics that we can do, what's needed, um, and starting to research those things so we can start handing off some stuff to comms. Uh, I also like to get, what I'm calling it like a tweetable database, so short facts that we pull out of our research, things that are just really cool sort of one-liners that we can have. So, you Laura, know I love you right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, just stuff that is, we don't, we don't have to make Laura like comb through our like dense research to find this stuff, but it's just like here's stuff we can put on the website, here's stuff we could tweet, um, just snippets of stuff that's like important. Um, so we'll have that hopefully up and running soon too once we start getting into research. Um, failure reports is something that Andrew talked about, which I think is a really cool idea, um, and we're gonna have to like hash out exactly what that means for us. Um, annual reports, as Mike talked about, uh, I think that a big part of the annual report is going to be monitoring and evaluations and um, research where we're headed in the next like year, what our planning is, and a lot of that's going to be coming from research. Um, looking into specific project proposals and doing exploratory research. So a lot of our initial research is going to just be exploring for what are the health needs, what are projects we could be running, where's their need, who can fulfill that need aside from us. And once we start identifying those things, we can put those together, um, moving them away from just sort of ideas into very firm projects that we can start running and handing them off to Sarah so that Sarah can start running those programs um, and connecting with the people that we need to be connecting with. Um, policy and advocacy pieces is something that I think we're going to have to have a like, conversation around to figure out how we're going to do this, if at all, and what the how that would look. Um, but once you take health out of the context of being a communicable disease or a like genetic disorder or something that's like inherently there, I mean, even those you can complicate and say are not necessarily purely biological, but environmental and social. Um, once you take that understanding of health, it becomes inherently political, and we're going to have political issues that are going to come up, and Laura talked about this in comms and how we're going to, what our public face for that is going to be. Um, and I think in terms of research, we're going to have to know where we stand on these issues, and we're going to have to have a good backing behind those, and part of those will be writing um, policy and advocacy pieces once we know where we're going to be at. Uh, what stand we're going to take, and these are things that can also go within academic articles, um, things that uh, they often have at the beginning of academic article or academic journals is having these policy pieces and these sort of briefs from uh, charities or other organizations that um, say these are the issues that we're seeing, this is our research, and this is why we think that we should be moving this way. Um, hopefully to rally other people in that community to get on board. So if we're working with uh, certain journals, we'll get more professors and academics involved. Other ones, like The Lancet, we get a lot of doctors involved. And um, those are really powerful communities to have backing you. And those are the people we want to be speaking to. Uh, at that, That's the kind of communication we want to be putting out to them. Um, and yeah, we'll do research proposals, so this is going to be tied to uh, grant writing, hopefully supporting who's ever doing grant writing with uh, coming up with different research ideas. We'll need someone who can do research grants. Um, uh, yeah, so doing the research grants, I think, so we can run projects. If we need to send someone like Andrew down there, it's not going to eat out of our um, core funding, but we can hopefully get grants for uh, the expenses associated with that, um, what's going to be needed to run the actual research project, and this is, can be a really good way to, so 
those programs as well in that a lot of the research um, grants will give you uh, the resources you need to run a program for an initial trial period. Um, so that's something we're going like, to we'll have to put together proposals on what we think are projects we really want to try out and see if we can get funding for that. Uh, the local organization database I've spoken about, um, so just having partners that we know uh, who to work with and when. Um, and then the rest of these are uh, stuff that we sort of have talked about. Uh, educational sponsorship programs, so there's questions up on Quandary right now, uh, which we can go over. Uh, Short-term voluntary volunteer exchanges or like, uh, volunteerism sort of stuff that we talked about yesterday. Uh, I think we can go through that as well once we start uh, moving in that direction more, figuring out what's needed, what are some of the complications with that, um, talking to partners on the ground and seeing what they feel would be the best for them um, moving forward. We've, Laura and I have talked about the campus program a little bit. I'm not going to get into it a lot now because we haven't really talked about it all that much and I don't know where it's how we're going to operate with that, um, but the general idea being that we're going to have campus advocacy, well, campus groups that we get involved with fundraising as well as sort of like info sessions, doing stuff like to engage them and get them involved with Doctors for Doctors. Um, and then, yeah, just general exploratory research is on there at certain time. So key constructs is sort of the approach that I'm taking to research. I think there is definitely sort of the epidemiological look at um, things. There's looking at strict health data, um, but it's within the context of these sort of social constructs that I think we have to keep in mind as we're going in. Um, I mean, we talked about it last night in sort of that, like, what are these white people doing in Nicaragua? And that's, like starts to hit on some of these things of, you know, what is your power and how do you manage that relationship and how do we create an effective dialogue with people so that it's not just these are people coming in with, like, a ton of resources and I know what to say. Um, I don't know how many of you have experience, like, talking to people like, in resource or countries, but... Charities are often seen as something that's not there for the long term and that you have to sort of manage yourself in front of them to say, like, oh, yes, I'm this kind of person and I have these sort of needs to get whatever resources you can out of them because their resources aren't applicable to you. And I think we have to, especially in a or research way, that's often going to be our first point of contact with a lot of groups, and I think we need to demonstrate that that's not who we are and set that branding right away, that we are going to be here for the long term. And we're not here to just throw resources any way at people, but to identify what their needs are and to be effective with that and to really listen to them. And that's a big part of the sort of dialogical approach of doing research. It's really spending that time to talk to people and figure that out as opposed to just parachuting in and like, throwing resources at people because that's what we think they need. Um, we want people to sort of like, get involved in that too and not like realize why they have those sort of, like, why those health issues exist in their community and that it's not just uh, like, how can they manage that. So looking at local solutions as well and figuring out what their ideas are. So it can often be that we will identify um, some of the problems, we will help coordinate efforts on that, provide resources where it's necessary, and then get them involved in sort of a solution around that. So, for example, if you go, to, there are certain communities where there are a lot of waterborne illnesses, and it's because the animals are drinking from the same water source as the people in that community. And without an understanding of disease vectors, that is often not something that clicks into people, that that's why people are getting sick. If we can give them that sort of technical knowledge, they can then use, we can work with them to come up with local solutions that fit within their idea. So maybe it's, okay, the um, 
animals will drink from one water source and that's dedicated to that water source and we'll set up a system for monitoring that while all the humans are using another water source. If that's something that they think is manageable for them, they have the resources, cool, we'll go with that. As opposed to us just going in and giving out to everybody, like here's a water filtration thing. So that's a really high resource for us, like resource use. And it's if it's not something that they're going to use, if it's not something that we demonstrate how to prepare, there's a lot of other things. So we want to make sure people are involved in that, knowing how to sort of carry that out afterwards. Um, I think our role in terms of an organization too is in these sort of local global partnerships. It's not that we're parachuting in and sort of doing what we think is best, but being a resource um, that really comes from a different sort of stance and using our power and influence and privilege to help people who don't have those same things. So to be able to be in Canada and to have access to the resources that we have and the networks that we have, we can influence change in a way that people in rural Nicaragua never can. And that's the simple fact of that and it's sad but it's that's our role is to help leverage our own position to benefit people in communities where they don't have that same position. Um, so we do have a role in this and we do provide benefits and it's not, it goes beyond just sort of sending resources down to people, but having this ongoing relationship and conversation to really help raise them up um, and give them access to what we have. Um, I won't go through all of these, but um, yeah, the last sort of ones I want to talk about are the technical versus local knowledge. I talked about it a little bit the other day. Um, but yeah, just being, I think people often get apologetic about doing work for international development organizations because it is this, they recognize the power difference and the resource difference. But I think that if you can go in understanding that you have a technical expertise and that's why like, we have to talk about sort of research involvement with like volunteerism and that sort of thing. Um, but if you have an expertise in a certain area, you can go in with that technical expertise as long as you understand that that's where the boundary lies. That, that is your, you're coming in as a technical expert and not a local expert. You do not know how that's going to interface with things in that community and you don't know how your program will roll out into that community unless you get community buy-in and community support and like, understanding of that project. So that's what we really want to, like, I want to delineate as a difference and that we're going to respect local knowledge and that is totally on par with technical knowledge and they have to be treated as sort of separate and equal um, forms of knowledge that we're going to be working with. Um, Methods, it's really like, I want to go as sort of multi-method as we can with this and really look at things in a really creative way. Um, qualitative stuff I think is so important and really, especially if we're getting involved in like local knowledge systems, you can't beat qualitative research methods for that. We're going to get like, really good stories from people doing this and a really good understanding of like what those local issues are. Um, we need stats and that's sort of the game in uh, development sectors is like you just need to have numbers on things. Um, so I think there and there that will become useful as well for, um, for us to map out where are there certain issues and how do we plan things. Um, so we'll be doing general statistics, epidemiology, and like, as we're going through these methods too, these are sort of the people that I will need as well, is people who can do qualitative research, people who can do statistics or epidemiology. Um, and then there's other sort of more interesting uh, types of research that like fall under those ones, like participatory action research. So the idea that you don't go in as a researcher and just investigate someone as like an outsider and then come back with your report on your findings, but that the community is involved and they are the researchers as well and like you were there as a facilitator of their sort of research and so you can send them out to do tasks and get involved in focus groups and other things where they are integral to the actual outcome of the research.
research, they feed back into it. So once you've written your report, they can review it and check it over to fact check you. So they're holding you accountable for their own knowledge. And I think by doing that, we also acknowledge their voice and we don't take their voice away from them. Um, so in terms of goal setting for like the breakout groups and some of the things I'd like to start doing today uh, is go through the list of deliverables. So anyone who's coming with me in the breakout group, I'd like to look at those, see if we need to make any changes or additions to those and then start breaking them down, um, getting a timeline for them, figuring out sort of where we'd like to be three months from now, six months from now. I know it's highly dependent, again, on like where Sarah's at uh, in terms of what grants we're getting, what programs are going on. It's dependent on what funding we have available. Um, there's lots of different things, but again, just trying to set something out so that we have something to work towards now, and we can change it as we go, and things come up, but to give us some sort of starting point at the moment. Uh, and also figuring out what the resource needs are for all the different projects we want to work on. So how many more volunteers do we need? What skill sets do they need? Which things do we need funding for? And you know, what's that involved in? Um, I'd also like to talk about research governance um, and in terms of like how we're going to continue working together, having meetings. Um, how we're going to communicate this because there's a lot going on and there's a lot we can do. But I think we have to really coordinate all of that quite well um, to pull it off. Um, and then, yeah, we can also get into like what blog post ideas people think. Um, this will come up more on, like, there's a lot of this stuff that will come up tomorrow as well um, with dependencies on comms and programs and ops and other things. Um, and we can go through and develop research questions, um, review questions that are already up on Quandary, and yeah, coming up with just ideas for what, when we say we want to do a failure report, what does that actually entail? Um, what's it going to look like? What are the risks of that and how do we manage that? Um, I know that's like a ton of stuff, but that's like the big outline of things that I am going to be doing in the next while in terms of the most macro level of things. So um, being able to tackle it and give it some sort of framework today would be really great to move forward when we're not all in the same room and able to work on it together. Uh, and that's me and research. Any questions?